All right, this is Plain Spoken. I'm always trying to have conversations that are worthy not just of having, but of listening to. I've had some really good conversations in the past around uh, gender, sexual orientation, modern gender theory, critical theory, the intersection of all those things. And uh, we're not hopefully going to be using <laughs> a lot of big words in this segment. I know I do that sometimes. Uh, but I've talked with Drew Enns in the past. If you haven't seen that, that was a good conversation uh, with a conversation partner from the left with respect to the intersection of all these fields. I've also had a decent conversation with Dr. David De Silva, who is a, a historian, classicist, um, and, and talked about human sexuality in the ancient world. So uh, this is not my main thing, uh, but also it feels cowardly if, if I don't talk through this stuff. I, I think that um, conservatives really don't do a good service to our faith when we're not equipped to talk through sexuality. I, I think we so easily get pigeonholed as bigots when we don't have anything to say about sex except, oh, I, I think being gay is wrong, and then that's it. That is, that is a very anemic theology of sexuality if we're on the side of right, we really should do better to understand human sexuality um, and to, to not just model it, but to critique it and to know how to speak about it in the context of the local church in such a way that is not um, worldly, but is also not uh, unnecessarily cruel or judgmental. Mm -hmm. There is a way to talk about sexuality. I'm not going to claim to be perfect at it, but there is a way to talk about it and navigate it within the local church. Christ is supposed to heal us communally, and that includes sexually. Uh, not in anything weird, but there are ways in which the community of faith should be ministering to one another about uh, sexuality and healing and wholeness. So to that end, I've asked Gary Ingram of uh, the Love and Truth Network, uh, Transforming Congregations. He's going to tell us about uh, his, affili uh, his affiliations, what he's about, um, he and I have not spoken a lot beforehand, but I've, I've watched his testimony, and I'm going to link to that so that you can watch that as well and, and hear his testimony about God's movement in his life and the ways in which God has transformed him. Uh, but I want to give the, the bulk of this time to him, not just ministering to me, but also to the, the church more broadly to, to minister to us in this current present uh, moment. So, Gary, thank you so much for joining me. How are you today? I'm doing well, Je uh, Jeffrey. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, I uh, like I said, I've seen your uh, the bulk of your testimony that's on your YouTube mm -hmm. channel. It's a fantastic uh, production, and you have several other testimonials of people tied to your network. Um, th the production quality is really quite good, so I'm surprised that there there's not a lot of people watching it just yet. So I'm hoping that we right. get some more people directed towards your YouTube page. Um, how long have you been, let's see, let's talk about the Love and Truth Network and then Transforming Congregations. Are those the same sure. thing? Or are those different things? They are different. Um, Transforming Congregations was founded back probably 35 or so years ago uh, within the United Methodist Church as a mm -hmm. renewal ministry for the UMC. And it was its own 501c3. And um, uh, back in, let me shift over to Love and Truth Network for a moment. Back in uh, 2013, my wife, Melissa, and I, uh, I'd been on staff at a, at a church, uh, pastoral staff for 12 years at a large church in upstate New York. And we really felt like the Lord was kind of giving me the boot out of my comfortable nest of 12 years, uh, which I wasn't terribly happy about at the time. But um, realizing finally that, oh, I think you're, you're calling us to, uh, to really begin ministering more specifically to pastors and to Christian leaders um, for the reality of their own sexual brokenness in many cases, um, but also for those who um, want to uh, minister more effectively, not just in the area of LGBTQ, but in uh, the reality of the stage four cancer, we believe that is very much uh, growing within the church of all kinds of relational and sexual brokenness. So we started Love and Truth Network to the broader church in 2013. And then in 2016, I was asked by Karen Booth, who had been running um, as a, she had been a UMC pastor. Uh, she was running um, Transforming Congregations and taken that over from uh, another person who had been running that about 12 years earlier. She needed to retire. And so she asked if I would step in to that role. So um, it, uh, TC Transforming Congregations has been under 
uh, the banner and the um, the 501c of good news now for uh, quite a few years. I don't remember just how many, mm -hmm. uh, but I've been working there since 2016. And of course, that's specifically to the UMC. Yeah, I guess I kind of knew. I, I guess I didn't know if Love and Truth Network was something separate, but I knew Transforming Congregations had been around because I referenced, yeah. um, I just did a recent piece on judicial uh, activism within the United Methodist Church, and in response to the Amy DeLong verdict several years ago, Karen Booth yes. wrote an article uh, in her capacity as the head of Transforming Congregations. So mm -hmm. I actually linked to the Transforming Congregations YouTube page. Um, I don't know if any traffic came your way at all from that, but I hope some does from this. Um, you said, okay, so Transforming Congregations is a renewal group within the United Methodist Church. Love and Truth Network is uh, more broad than that. It's it's anyone yeah. who wants to hear about, you called yes. it the stage four cancer, uh, metastasizing throughout the church. And in America, is it centered in America, or is it even concerned with global spread of this ideology? Mm -hmm. Well, I think we see it um, in many places globally. Now, there are obviously more, and we see this in the UMC too, obviously, that there are far more conservative, orthodox, um, uh, pretty grounded understandings of common sense when it comes to sexuality and identity mm -hmm. and things of that nature in places like Africa. And I'm not saying that all the outworkings of that are necessarily always good by a long shot. Sometimes sure. they're way too extreme, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of having a, a, a pretty well-rooted understanding of the fact that we were created as male and female in the image of God for one another mm -hmm. um, is, is pretty basically understood in a lot of parts of the world, but in many, certainly here in the West, certainly in the U S um, it's it's becoming more and more distorted. Yeah. it's So I've got my own theories as to why that is, what causative factors there are, what correlative factors there are. And um, I've it's been interesting since, you know, this is not my main thing, but I do comment on human sexuality from time to time and the, the deleterious effect it's having on institutions. Uh, I've had a number of gay men in particular, um, some... Some who have left that way of life behind, but many who are actively involved in it and think that there's nothing wrong with it, they mm -hmm. just like the way that I talk about it, and they, they politely push back and argue and, and push me on. And it's, it's made me have to read more and make sure that what I believe is not based on uh, just bias or, or bigotry, right. but that there are reasons as to why I believe what I believe. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, I guess, let's start with something that's, that's juicy. Do you... Do you think that there are things that you could summarize pretty succinctly that most people really don't know but really should about human sexuality that, that kind of helps them navigate these things better than the average person? Well, yeah, great question. I The first thing that comes to my mind is the reality, and, and this is one of the underpinnings of Love and Truth Network, is that we have been made in the image of God, as I said earlier, mm -hmm. made in the image of God as male and female. There is no other created being on the on the planet that bears God's image. And we believe based on Genesis 126 and 27, as you get through 27, um, it, God is is talking about the reality that um, he has made him male and female, or has made him in his image male and female. He's made them. And this idea, we believe that there's a way that a woman bears the image of God in a way that is of equal value, mm -hmm. which the church has not always gotten right, right? Sure. It is of equal value, but is um, distinct and unique mm -hmm. and, and and intentionally meant to be so. And so the, there, I, I don't think, I, I hardly ever hear sermons um, on being made in the image of God and how that connects to our sexuality. Uh, there's probably more happening now, but man, growing up in the church, I never heard anything about that. And, and that is the most um, rudimentary, fundamental understanding, I think, uh, as God is laying down the foundations of the earth, that he's establishing us not only as male and female, as sexual beings, but as ones who bear his image. And mm -hmm. out of our femininity, out of our masculinity, we bear a certain aspect of the image of God. And and this is, and, and honestly, saying something that's that would be somewhat controversial, when I have time to unpack this more, it, yeah. it's, it, it probably isn't as controversial, but... What I would say is, as one who comes out of the LGBT world, who comes out of um, once identifying as a gay man, once bartending at a gay club, I mean, having embraced all of that, having grown up in the church, all of that, um, I, you know, I get that kind of um, identity confusion, uh, even even some for a very short period of time, some confusion about or kind of longing to be the other gender in a way, feeling like I, I didn't fit in the world of boys and men, et cetera. 
So I get that. But what I think that most of us in the in the heterosexual population don't understand is that if the if the litmus test is being made in the image of God, male and female, and that is what it means to mm -hmm. be truly masculine or what it means to be truly feminine. Frankly, we're all identity confused. So not in terms of who I'm sexually attracted to. Honestly, good for you. I mean, you know, if, if, if there's never been a struggle there, that's a blessing. That's wonderful when sure. it comes to that issue. But does that mean that we have a clue that, that as a straight guy, as a guy who uh, desires women or, or women that desires men, that, that there's an automatic kind of understanding of, oh, wow, how do I live out the mystery of this gift well? Of course not. And so there's so much to lean into when it comes to understanding our sexuality, not just in terms of the, uh, having sex and how to steward that, which is very important, mm -hmm. but also just relationally, we're never not sexual beings. And so even relationally, how do we navigate that well? How do we use our sexuality and our image bearing as a way of blessing and securing others in the good of who God calls them to be? I think those are really important issues that we very rarely hear anything about. So what I like about what you said, I mean, the, the key phrase that is uh, the good soundbite is, where every single person is gender confused. The the thing I like about that is um, in any given culture, any given era, we create taboos where, you know, we have us normal sinners over here, but these ones over here, they're the really nasty, icky ones. And right, um, right now, the, the place where society is pushing us is on the trans uh, community, and, and there is a temptation, a kind of reactionary conservative temptation to go, Man, these gay folks, I kind of get that, but these trans ones, they're really messed up. And the critique from your end I, I hear is, nah, really, this is a pretty natural phenomenon of um, feeling alienated in your own skin and especially not really knowing how to navigate the world in these bodies God has given us. You know, uh, that's that's a natural way. And so there, I, I like the impulse to rebuke those who act like, of course, you're going to be straight, and of course, you're going to feel comfortable in your body, and of course, you know, no, the, I mean, sure, there are some who are very natural and able to navigate mm -hmm. these things, and but that's really quite exceptional, and that there really shouldn't be shame with people who don't subjectively have that experience. Does that all sound yes, like I, a, Go ahead. I, I agree with that, and a couple things. I um, I think that, so let me just back up and, yeah. and uh, rather than saying that we're all gender confused, I would say we're all identity confused. Okay. And I understand that those can be used interchangeably. Uh, but I, but to make a distinction there, I, I, I see no difference whatsoever between gender and sex. I think those two words are sure. interchangeable. And of yeah. course, uh, you know, the, the culture today has divorced them from one another and made them utterly different things. Uh, so, or, or potentially utterly different things. So I, I think that there are many people who aren't wrestling with their sense of gender identity, mm -hmm. but in terms of their their God-given identity as image bearers, yes. that's where I think that every person on the planet is broken and confused and doesn't know how to live that out well. And and oftentimes I think in the church, we have this knee-jerk reaction for the, the, ma the vast majority of people who are opposite sex attracted. Um, first of all, within that, there's a huge range of what brokenness looks like, mm -hmm. how how men use women, how women use men, how, you know, and and um, in a wide range. But um, the reality that if we want to press into more fully, what does it mean to be a man or a woman made in God's image? How do I, again, live that out? Well, how do I press into like, how should that inform my life? And how should that change my life as a mm -hmm. follower of Jesus Christ? Yeah. I think those are very important questions that not only connect, obviously they connect to the way we act and function sexually, mm -hmm. they should connect also to the identity I embrace, whether that is I'm a gay man and God's totally fine with that, mm -hmm. or someone like me who believes in, who practices transformational ministry, or I mean, for whatever label, but believes that God has the ability to change and transform our lives. And that doesn't necessarily look like the eradication of all temptation, but right. freedom does not require the eradication of all temptation, whether it's those two extremes or something kind of in the middle, mm -hmm. which is, you know, celibate gay Christianity, which for me is still a massive issue um, because and, and many uh, evangelical churches are, are just embracing that perspective because it seems like the nicer perspective. It seems like, oh, so you're not saying that you should have sex with somebody of the same gender, same sex, 
you're not um, you're not out practicing that. You believe in biblical marriage, mm -hmm. but but you're just you're just I say that in scare quotes. Just you're just taking an identity that if you were to act on would be sin, and you're hyphenating that and marrying it to your Christianity, and you're insisting that that is your identity. Mm -hmm. uh, there's to me that is a massive fault line. The, uh, um, and the it's code not word semantics. for that is uh, side B Christianity, right? It, yes, it is. Right, right. Side A would be full on, God totally fine with gay sex, gay marriage. Um, I, I mean, of course, there'd be some things they would say that probably aren't healthy. But, mm -hmm. but by and large, he's fine with those kinds of relationships. That's side A. Side B would be, no, we see the biblical mandate on sex and marriage. And so we disagree with that. But we're going to take ownership of a gay identity and marry that to our Christianity. And so much of my life will revolve around my gayness, my queerness, my gender non-binary-ness, yeah, yeah. uh, whatever. Um, so and I saw Rosaria, huge. you know the word, the name Rosaria Butterfield. Oh yeah, very so much so. She has, she has an amazing, she's just an amazing person, but uh, she, is. she did an interview on, uh, I can never think of his name, Bennett. I don't, oh, oh yeah. Um, yes. Uh, Sure. <laughs> yes, I know it well, not, but I'm so he's blank. he is. I forget if he's. Oh, it's Beckett Cook. Thank Beckett you, Cook. Beckett Cook. Yep. Interviewed Rosaria Butterfield. Uh, she is now married to a man and has left uh, her gay identity behind. I believe she's married to a pastor. Yes. Yeah, and I believe Beckett is Beckett married. Do you know? No, no. Okay, he he's not. he's celibate, but he is not side B. They had a, a conversation about how destructive side B Christianity is because there there is no other sin that we allow people to marry to their faith and to have right. some kind of hyphenated relationship with their faith. If they're if you're a Christian that you're then you're at war with sin and whatever that sin is has no right. rightful place at the side of Jesus. Um, and so I think there are a lot of people who do immediately hear of the theology around side B Christianity and they go, well yeah 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 at least they're not having gay sex. Right. Whatever. And that's really not, I mean, yes, I mean, it's, it's bad to have gay sex, but it's also really bad to promote a, a warped, corrupted understanding of uh, a person that's made in God's image and uh, really selling short the transformative power of the Holy Spirit. Now, I, I think we should be clear about, I think you already kind of alluded to it. Some people really are of the mind that, hey, if you have the Holy Spirit, he's going to make you a red-blooded man, and you're going to want women. <laughs> and um, I don't think, I know that I don't believe it always happens that way. Right. Um, no. I, I think that our desires are just a very difficult, uh, I'm, I'm not, I, so I would say the Holy Spirit can do that to somebody if yes, he, he desires can. and if if I don't think that God makes us change in ways that we don't want to however if it's uh, to God's glory and it's his will I, I would say that, that that can happen and and you have said that you come out of the LGBTQ community you were actively involved in the gay lifestyle for several yeah. years and yet you're married to a woman and you two have two biological children together is yes yes two boys yep so to to at least that degree you have seen that transformation in your life, and you've subjectively experienced this. Um, what's there to be said about, um, is ex-gay still the term for it, or is there another word for individuals that were identifying with gender nonconformity and have repented and sought uh, to, to live into more traditional understandings of human sexuality? Yeah, well, so the you know, the phrase, the term uh, ex-gay has has been um, really vilified. Right. And so it, there are times I think that it can be helpful to um, to kind of redescribe um, uh, something that is true of us and true of the transformation. So I honestly never really cared uh, one way or the other whether somebody referred to me as ex-gay or not. But the other problem with the phrase is I think it does imply um, uh, it, it can imply like a, a kind of a flip flop kind of, it, it may, people can take from that. Oh, you were suddenly, that's where, you know, in part, um, the, the, the pejorative term, pray the gay away, oh, yeah. uh, sort of came from. Right. And so of course, here's the thing. We, none of us that are, that are in, you know, sister ministries that I'm involved with, uh, believe in the nonsense of pray the gay away. Now is prayer a huge part of our Christian life and was par prayer a part of that? Sure, but it, the the term was never meant to actually communicate that. It was just this kind of, oh, you go to the altar, you pray the demon of this out, or you pray this out, and suddenly mm -hmm. the church is saying that's all you need. And and I think there are some people that were confused about that and and speaking wrongly about that. You alluded to that, 
but but the you know so whether it's most of us are not referred to as ex-gay anymore again just because of the negativity of the term but i know like for example the change movement um is it, is kind of using more of the phrase once gay i mean it's the same thing in a sense but i but i think it it's less it, it communicates less the idea of like a flip flop or a sudden snap your fingers and you've gone from one to the other poop, you know, right. uh, but it's, yeah. it's a journey. I mean, the truth is it's, it's the, what we are on an authentic um, uh, walk with Jesus for those who come out of the LGBT community of whatever version that looks like. Mm -hmm. All we're doing is the same thing that God has called every, every other uh, son and daughter to, which is discipleship. That's what this is about. It's yeah. not about conversion therapy. It's not about any of that nonsense. It's about discipleship. So, yeah, I, I think where people get really uncomfortable is that they imagine, you know, everybody's happy with discipleship if it's like, hey, I, I give a little bit more money to the church, and right. I begin each day with a little prayer and a little devotional. But when discipleship changes the way that we think, the way that we respond to our passions, uh, the way that we um, spend our time and conduct ourselves in the household, like there are very deep personal ways in which Christ not only wants to, but can radically transform our lives, and one of those ways is in the bedroom. And when mm -hmm. you read the scriptures, it becomes pretty clear that what we do in the bedroom really matters, and it's not just as simple as don't have sex with someone of the same biological sex. There's right. a wide array of specific acts that are condemned but then there's also certain sexual principles that are maintained across the, the Christian Jewish canon about how we are to use our bodies and how we are not to use our bodies. Um, the widespread scriptural illiteracy within the American church, I think, has meant that a lot of people are, are just not familiar with these principles right. and with a lot of these things being sin. In particular, what's concerning is regular uh, polling of evangelical, young evangelical Christians who don't think it's a sin to cohabitate before marriage, right. uh, straight ones. So uh, when you and I briefly corresponded before this conversation, um, you gave me the impression that you're concerned as well, not just with reestablishing this line, no gay is bad, but also really advancing the line of scrimmage against the culture to say, there's a lot of things that's bad that we're trying to to fudge and really need to reclaim, no, 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 this is unacceptable. So um, I've already said cohabitation outside of marriage. What other mm -hmm. uh, particular areas of sexual sin do you think our culture as a whole needs a refresher on if they're going to claim the title Christian? Oh, yeah, great question. And, and honestly, to be clear, we are far more concerned not about the LGBT uh, stuff that's happening in culture and is encroaching upon the church. That's concerning, obviously, from a number of fronts. But the biggest concern is the much, much longer standing, much, much more secretive. I mean, the, the church has Mount Everest, you know, residing under the the, the carpets of the church uh, that we keep, keep sweeping stuff under. And, and a huge uh, chunk of that is sexual sin of a variety of sorts, whether it's adultery or it's fornication. I mean, I haven't talked about this in a long time, but I remember, I can't remember what year it was now. You might know off the top of your head, but the Ashley Madison scandal, right, of the 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 adultery website. And mm -hmm. um, I, I remember being at a church and speaking at that church, and the pastor introduced me. I didn't even know this before he introduced me, but he was introducing me and said, you know, th these are serious issues. And one of my beloved professors uh, from school, um, everybody loved him, wonderful, gregarious guy. His name showed up on mm. that exposure. Uh, and he went home and killed himself oh, um, wow. after his name was exposed. And yeah. so, I mean, that really comes home to root. So the the reality of adultery, the reality of fornication, the reality of massive pornography and masturbation addiction uh, going on in the church uh, simultaneously to supposedly walking out a Christian life mm -hmm. um, is th this double living is absolutely robbing us of of the vitality that God desires. And going back to something you you mentioned or alluded to earlier, I think the issues going on in our culture right now, uh, I love the church mm -hmm. and I loved being a pastor. I love, you know, in some ways, pastoring pastors walking alongside of them, not just in their own brokenness, but as they're, we want to equip the church to be really safe um, and transformational and to be really teaching hospitals um, on the forefront of these issues. And that's what we're about. But um, the, the reality that so many um, pastors and other leaders are wrestling and struggling and failing in many ways and have just 
um, uh, are living this double life, getting up. My my is it my sister in law, um, and this is public knowledge. They have a ministry now that ministers to uh, sexual abuse within the context of the Protestant Church, which is a rampant issue in the abuse of women. Uh, she was abused by her pastor father, sexually abused from the mm. time that she was ten until I think she was eighteen. She had to sit in the front row and listen to him preach. He was gregarious. Everyone loved him. Had no idea this stuff was going on. And, and so again, whether that's that happens more often than we think. Yeah. But it's um, so sexual abuse, uh, uh, and then you know, a, um, uh, even abortion happening within the concepts of the church. I don't agree with abortion. Someone may say or stand against it, but yet when they become pregnant because of their hidden sexual sin, nobody can know about it. So therefore now I've got to go and they feel like they have to go and get an abortion. So mm. there's just so much compromise that happens in the context of our secrecy and our refusal to live out a biblical mandate. The other, th so what I would contrast from what you just said or what you just asked a moment ago is the reality is, is sex isn't just neutral. God's design for sex is glorious. It is beautiful. It is intended to more deeply connect and bond a husband and wife together uh, in in just this rich and full and exclusive relationship. It is it's not just neutral. It is glorious and 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 incredible when it's done God's way. Everything else, and and of course Jesus talks about this in Matthew nineteen when he's asked about divorce. He goes back and he affirms in Genesis two genders, not however many. Sure, uh, there's two genders that God made, and on top of that. Uh, this idea that that sex was meant to be um, uh, between one man and one woman, mm -hmm. um, and so anything outside of that is 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 um, is sin. Anything outside of that is not glorious. And so we need to be talking more in the church, not just about what we're against, but what are we for? How can we strengthen marriages? How can we strengthen families? And the last thing I'll say, and this is getting off in, in the weeds a little bit, but it's very core to what our ministry is about. Mm -hmm. Is we? It's kind of ironic. I feel like God has called us and is drawing us into relationship with churches uh, and pastors and leadership teams, not only to address the LGBT issue, which is what everybody thinks when they hear our story, like, oh, man, we need help on this. We love doing that. But we're going to bring first and foremost, before we even talk about that, mm -hmm. we're going to talk about the brokenness in the church first, heterosexually and all that, because we believe that, um, that much of what lies that's going on with culture right now lies at the feet of the church. And uh, because we've lost our light, we've lost our saltiness because of the compromise that's going on there and so we the um but what we find uh so important is god is calling us to address these issues mm -hmm. but to bring the church back to the reality that we have such pathetic and meager relationships we are we are nearly all of us as christians living double lives in one manner in one way or another mm -hmm. whether it's a food addiction whether it's a chemical addiction whether it's scrolling whether it's shopping whether it's sex we have all of these things that we are funneling our, our time and our, our, our passions into, and almost no one in the church knows that about us. We present the best parts of ourselves for mm -hmm. everyone to see. We are living completely anti-biblical, and we wonder why we can't break free of these addictions and these patterns of sin that the new man or the new woman hates, but the flesh is never going to be rejuvenated. It's never going to be changed as long as we are in this life. The best I believe we can have or we can be is where the, the new man or the wo new woman is walking in the light, like 1 John 1, 7 tells us, that we are confessing our sins to one another and praying for each other, that we might um, be healed, like James um, 5, 16 tells us. But who's living that out in the church? It's very rare. Men's groups, women's groups, small groups, almost none of them are actually practicing that with each other. And we think that is what's allowing so much of the decay on a variety of fronts in the church. So, yeah, we could talk for hours. Um, I, I need to affirm, I lead a men's group at my church, and dealing with these issues is an excellent way to guarantee that that men's group is not going to exist anymore. Um, I, I had Bishop Scott Jones on here, um, interviewed him a few months ago, and I talked about how difficult it is to do small group ministry that's transformational and hits on the deeper parts of life because people will leave. Uh, people sign mm -hmm. up to follow Jesus, but then whenever it comes to actually letting him take your sin away, so many people just cannot imagine functioning without their sin, and they're very uh, intimidated and and even defensive of it. And uh, we've lost a lot of people in the church whenever we've tried to help them discern, okay, it's time to get to the next level and say goodbye to some of these things that have always been with you. You know, I think there's a reason why Jesus 
if your eye causes you to sin, you gouge it out. If your hand causes right. you to sin, there is no understanding of sin that is endemic, that is acceptable. We we cut the sin out, even if especially if it hurts. Jesus prepares mm-hmm. us for that. But yeah, to imagine uh, when when people have these homes they can go to and be alone, and they don't have to leave. You've got them in the church, but they're here on their own terms, and don't push them too much because they'll leave. It's a really hard time to to for the church to actually be the church and compel the people. To, you know, I really don't think it can be done without the presence and power of the Holy Spirit and bold people like you who come and say things flat. You said a number of things flatly that a lot of people would go, wait, 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 I'm not sure about that. You know, so most people would be on board. Okay, yeah, adultery, it's in the Bible a lot. Fornication, that's in the Bible a lot. Masturbation, uh, I don't know about that. Uh, pornography, mm-hmm. I don't remember any scripture about that. Um, abortion, you know, I know a lot of people make it sound kind of fuzzy. You just go through this list like it's matter of fact for people, and and I think that that's because you are so instantiated in these principles, these scriptural principles about what sexuality is for, what makes sexuality good. Let me give you some pushback on one thing. This is something I say, sure. and I have never gotten anyone to affirm it at all. Um, so odds are I'm wrong. I just can't see how I'm wrong. Mm. But um, before I say it, um, I'm not pure at all. Um, I'm guilty of massive sexual sin. Uh, before I married my wife, I was with many women. Um, a lot of that was when I was an atheist, and of course I would do that. Uh, a lot of it was when I was coming back to Jesus, and and I was... So I, I'm not lifting this up from a place where I'm just perfect, and I... Sure. Uh, yeah. So um, the the thing I have to say is it does not seem to me that human sexuality is uh, by nature good or uh, for all people. Uh, From the language that Jesus and Paul use, it seems to me that sexuality is actually something that's quite dangerous, uh, is generally harmful and dangerous to our walk with the Lord. And if, if this is the world of sexuality, this is the amount of it that I can use and not upset the Lord but that the Lord is never actually, all right, I'm glad you're having sex, Jeffrey. It's, it's a dangerous thing that has life and death, uh, uh, long-term consequences, and really should not be engaged outside of very strict, very controlled confines um, because it's like fire, you know, and how great a fire is set aflame uh, by the human tongue, you know, how great a fire is set mm-hmm. aflame by poor execu- uh, use of human sexuality. So I, I see a lot of people on the conservative side wanting to say, look, sexuality is great. Oh, man, it's so great. And God has designed it for you to enjoy. And I wonder if that really sets a lot of gender non-conforming people up for just misery going, man, it was made to be great, and I just can't enjoy it the way other people do. I think it's most... I, I wonder if it's much more effective just to go, look, it feels great, because sin feels great, it does have a practical purpose, and having children is wonderful, and we need to be very clear that sex and child-making is very directly connected, uh, but but we're not here to affirm your sexuality. Your sexuality is a danger, and you need to keep that in check. If you get to use it at all, great, I guess, but Jesus didn't have sex, and he's right by the Father. We don't go, oh, poor Jesus, he didn't have sex, you know? Mm -hmm. Paul, same thing. You can have a wonderful, full life that does not miss out on anything if you don't have sex. Sex is completely irrelevant. So if it is going to be a part of you, you keep that under wraps. You keep it under control, and if you start feeling loosey-goosey about it, you can just guarantee you're not right with God. Okay, so that's, that's my whole spiel that I say. Where do you think... Do you think that I'm wrong? Do you think that that's an unnecessary tack to take? Um, do you think it's more unhelpful to take that line, or do you see why it is that I would want to stake out that position as opposed to... I, I did some explanation, but how does all that rub you, Gary? No, I, yeah, I love what you're posing and asking. As, you're, as you are asking it, there's about, I don't know, it feels like there's countless uh, sparks that I want to respond to. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I'm not going to be able to either remember no, them all yeah. or get them all in no, anyway. So, uh, but so I'm, I'm reminded, you mentioned the fire, right? Mm-hmm. And I often use the analogy when we lived in New York that we had a couple of different sources of heat, but our favorite one was our wood stove. 
that was in uh, the basement family room. Mm-hmm. Absolutely loved that and more than anything else. And uh, but and, and in its container, in its proper place, it serves us. It's beautiful. There was a glass front to the, you know, the fireplace or whatever. And and uh, and it's warm. It gives life. And but so why not just take it out of its container and just put the fire on the floor? Oh, sure. I mean, why yeah. not? Right. <laughs> and that's the, and so to me, that is a every analogy breaks down somewhere, obviously. But I think the the point is that God creates all of this amazing and great and glorious stuff. And and the and Satan, who wants to be like God, wants to create, can't create anything. All he can do is come along and mar it and make it um, addictive and and uh, leading to death and all this kinds of uh, thing. And so I think that's really what he's done with this incredible gift. I don't think that sexuality is meant to be neutral. I think it is. I mean, the reality that God has called us to be co-creators through sexual union of not just not just creating other creatures, but creating other image bearers that now have eternal souls. I mean, that is mind blowing when you think about it in those terms. And and so this incredible gift that he has given us. And again, I, I still come back to this idea that even, you know, not just not just like from a biblical perspective, but from a, a scientific understanding of how pleasure chemicals are released in the brain and, and that there's um, there's a bond, you know, there's bonding uh, that occurs um, that isn't just accidental, like science stumbled upon that or came upon that in some fashion or another, but it's what God always intended. And the intention again was for this one union. Mm-hmm. Um, it, that, that's the ideal. And in that there is beauty, there is glory, there is, um, there is a, a wonder and a richness. So I also, on the other side, I also hear that, um, when, when people are just talking about, oh, it's so wonderful, it's so great, it's so glorious, it's so this and so that. Mm-hmm. I've also heard evangelical leaders talk about the idea that nothing's off limits in the bedroom, right? And, the, and, and I, and I always, I think, wait a minute, what if the, when, I think when that's said and that, mm-hmm. and there's nothing, nothing is communicated around that. First of all, that is a massive statement that probably requires several weeks. If you're going to bring that up and say that, <laughs> what are you actually talking about? Because, yeah. Because maybe for the guy, nothing should be off limits, but maybe for his wife, uh, there are things that are off limits or vice versa, it, or they just don't, they, they don't, they feel degrading. They don't feel life-giving. Sure. And yet out of his lust, you know, that's the other thing. Are we talking about lust here? Are we talking about love? Are we talking about building the other person up? Are we talking about being a gift to the other or extracting and, and, um, uh, and, and just trying to reach the, you know, the highest pinnacle of, um, of my next orgasm. I mean, right. it, yeah. what are we talking about here? Well, that's not, lust is not obviously the thing that God is talking about that's glorious. It is genuine love. And so I do think that our sexuality, uh, while Jesus didn't have sex, uh, this connects too to the reality that I believe sex goes way beyond the activity of sex, sexual union and intercourse or whatever mm-hmm. that's going to be. Um, it, it, we never are not sexual beings. Um, you know, we are in our masculinity. I'm a sexual being in, in, in my wife's femininity. She's a sexual being, Mm -hmm. how she relates to other women, how she relates to other men is unique in her femininity from the way that I do. And, and so to to understand what, what I would say is there is no way to be, not be a sexed being as having a a sex, but I would say there is a way to be, to navigate the world non-sexually. Would you say that that, that is a fiction? Well, to navigate the world non-sexually, to me, the first thing that comes to my mind is, and there'll be questions that you ask or that come up that mm-hmm. I'm not, I certainly will not have all the answers to you by long shot. But when you ask that question, the first thing that comes to my mind is someone who um, uh, is asexual or experiences asexuality. They don't right. experience any kind of real draw, you know, toward uh, anyone uh, mm-hmm. sexually. And, and what I have found, this is not always true by a long shot. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, there's always the red herring that's like, well, what if, what about, and, but what I've often found is that many times that asexuality flows out of, uh, childhood trauma of, of physical abuse, emotional abuse, often Mm -hmm. sexual abuse. Um, I don't think that those things have to be present for someone to feel asexual for sure, but those often do. And so I, I think that whether, um, nobody should be made to feel ashamed if they're, if, if they have, um, a sense of, of, of being asexual or just a diminished sense of sexuality. Mm-hmm. And, and perhaps, um, you know, perhaps God may be calling them 
um, to to live as you know celibate uh, folks who are doing uh, ministry and singleness and um, uh, you know not not committed to marriage. Where again, Paul talks about the idea of not being distracted, you know, really by marriage, be able to be fully devoted to the the work of Christ or what He's called you to. Mm -hmm. That's a high calling, and I think too often in the church, a we don't talk enough about we're not really talking to singles. Everything is uh, is uh, designed around the nuclear family. And I think that rather than diminishing the value of the nuclear family, which I think has profound and huge value, we need to elevate the reality of singleness. And certainly we need to elevate the reality that um, being celibate and feeling like God has called us to celibacy and something that we want to do mm -hmm. is not a disease. It's actually something that is a, um, a, a wonderful life's calling. Mm -hmm. That's separate from um, that can be separate from asexuality. Again, don't have all the answers sure. to that, but I think there's a lot that could be explored. I mean, asexuality is part of the acronym um, of the LGBTQIA, um, and and uh, first of all, the I, the uh, the um, those who are intersexed, really the fact that they're being um, uh, shoehorned into the acronym is really part of the red herring to say, yeah, but what about, you mm -hmm. know, what about the one who um, has, uh, you know, ambiguous genitalia or has experienced something that is not clearly male or female, yeah. uh, some part of their anatomy. And so because of that now, we supposedly should justify everything else. Sure. Um, but asexuality to me seems like an odd thing also to kind of have in the acronym um, uh, of LGBTQIA. I think there are things that can be explored there um, in in um, for those who have a desire to do that. Yeah. Uh, to to kind of see, you know, what, is there trauma? Is there something? Is there a way that I'm um, pushing away from something that that God designed that's actually good? Um, or perhaps is He calling me into something that's more a uh, vocational, lifelong uh, celibate ministry? So I, I yeah. The the reason I inquire about that is more about practical. Um conduct within the body of Christ, because, um, of course, we live in an era where, for a lot of people, female clergy is just an instantiated reality. It's not worth even talking about anymore, It's, for, but we have a, a sincere complementarian versus egalitarian debate that happens between right. the Reformed world and Arminian world. And what a lot of Reformed people, you know, sure, I'm sure there are some Reformed people that's just like, women's is bad, and they rebelled in Eden, and they have no place up front. The vast majority I speak to don't believe anything like that. They believe right. that there are group dynamics that have always been self-evident that we have removed from, namely that women cannot move through the world in an unsexed way, whereas men can. Um, so in a group dynamic, a man can stand at the front and be received as somewhat androgynous or non-sexed, a non-sexual being, but women really don't have that ability, and it's not because we're sexist, it's because we're <laughs> we're programmed a certain way naturally in group dynamics. It's because the rest of the guys in the room, not because of her so much. Maybe. I mean, it yeah. is. Yeah, it, well, I, yeah, go ahead. It's how she's being perceived, I think. Yes. Yeah, it's not, it's not at all the way that an individual is walking or talking or advertising right. oneself. It really is just the nature of male psychology versus female mm -hmm. psychology and group dynamics. And so there are some people who say, well, that shouldn't have any bearing in the body of Christ, but then time and time again, we see that it does. And so we can rail against it, or we can... Uh, and that's not to say that that I necessarily subscribe to that, but it does seem a disingenuous conversation whenever um, we just say men and women move through the world in exactly the same way and can do ex the exact same things regardless right. of who they're with. That just seems very aspirational. But then part of me wants to agree with you because there are so many times that people in the church want to operate as though sex is not a reality. Oh, it's no big deal that uh, so-and-so is spending a lot of time unsupervised with this person of right. the opposite sex. And then, oh my gosh, you can believe that they're actually sleeping with each other, you know, yeah. or, uh, you know, we have this around children. We like to imagine that there are just people in the church that are not sexual beings, and we can trust them. And I think time and time again, we find, mm, no, they're they're people that have sexual desires, and if they're left to their own devices, will not always use them well, and so we need to guard against each other's sexuality, and it is better just to see everybody as a sexual creature that can't really be trusted with their sexuality. I kind of want to direct the other you way. To, yeah, go ahead. The other way of dealing with that, I think, I agree with what you just said, but I think the other way of dealing with that, in a biblical way of dealing with that, is mm -hmm. to actually obey the scriptures 
about confessing our sins to one another and walking in the light with one another and encouraging one another, as Hebrews says, uh, as, uh, as long as it is called today, so that our hearts are not hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. The truth mm-hmm. is, in most churches, we do not know one another at all. We know about our jobs, our kids, our, you know, whatever, uh, all kinds of facts, like reading a story about somebody. Mm-hmm. We could read their history. We could maybe write the book about their history. But could we say anything about their heart? Could we say anything about their genuine struggles? No, because we've not allowed people, we've not allowed people in, we've not chosen right. to be vulnerable enough right. to actually let people in. And so therefore, part of what you're describing, it's inherent. Yeah. I mean, if you're not going to do that, of course, uh, uh, you're going to fail. One of our, we, we lead a, a Living Waters program, which is was produced 40 plus years ago, its origins by, by Andrew Kamiski and uh, Desert Stream Ministries. And it's an inner healing, 20 week inner healing discipleship program. And one of the things that Andy writes about that's so key uh, in the material is he makes the statement that we all struggle with weakness. Every person on the planet struggles with weakness. If we would admit our weakness, if Mm -hmm. we would be honest with others, if we would, uh, we believe that every son of God needs a band of brothers, every daughter of God needs a band of sisters who fully, like three or four or five that are doing life together and, um, and that we know everything about one another. That's the kind of biblical, very much biblical community. Andy is saying, that if we will not reveal our weakness, it will absolutely become wickedness. So it's no surprise. Nobody should be scratching their head thinking, oh my God, how did this happen? We are fostering this unintentionally, but we are fostering this behavior. Not, I'm not, we're not fostering sexual sin, but we're fostering the secretive behavior that leads to it mm-hmm. um, unintentionally in our churches. And what you're responding to is me saying that when we trust one another and allow each other privacy, then we are inviting sin to take hold. And so there needs to be a regular culture of shining light in dark places in right. the church. And well, so, Wesley's bands, right? I mean, I think yeah, that's what he I was, was out of something. Yeah. Yeah, so my brother is part of a Wesleyan band. Kevin Watson here in Oklahoma has been a, a big part of trying to circulate, more, make more common knowledge about the class meeting and the band meeting. Class mm-hmm. meetings being co-ed, band meetings always being gender segregated. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, I... I, I hope that I hope it continues. To, it's just one of these things you have to annoy people about and just push them at. Do you have a band of brothers? Do you have a band of brothers? You know, because we can sit around and talk about how miserable we are all day, but what are you actually right. doing about it? And that that really does seem key. And it seems so strange. I mean, it's it's so many people's nightmare to sit with a couple dudes at a table and talk about your sexual sin. Um, but go ahead. Here's the thing I've seen over and over again, and I would love. To, um, you know, if we ever have a chance to do a podcast again, I mean, it, I would love to do something around this particular topic. I, as a, as a guy who comes out of the LGBT world and, and uh, you know, it, my thought was what straight guy is ever going to want to sit and talk with me about anything? Who, mm-hmm. What guy is, and I, I wound up in my, um, as I worked at this church, I originally was hired as their business administrator and still in a pastoral role over volunteers and things of that nature. And then it morphed into where I, I became the director of, of uh, the counseling uh, ministry and so had lots of um, pastoral care in in that arena then finally the pastor of soul care ministry so i was over the counseling over recovery and uh, programs etc and uh, it blew me away how i mean really what god did in that time was was um help me understand what i needed to know to be able to do the role that i'm doing now Mm -hmm. and which he does for all of us um kind of that building up but what i realize now is that um uh the, the idea, I mean, when men are looking, uh, when they need help, when their marriages are rest, are struggling, when they're caught up in addiction, they can either continue to hide it, which mm-hmm. many do, yeah. or if there's a real avenue that's being um, communicated in the church, in, and there, the way it's communicated in the, the tone, the posturing around it from the pulpit and in other places in the church is so critical. And people knowing that there is real uh, help and support that is non, that's not about shaming you. Mm-hmm. It's about really walking alongside of you about people who've gone before you, you and these avenues are available for you. I, I wound up leading several groups of, of, um, men. I have one now, uh, that, that is made up of, um, five to seven guys. And, and they're all dealing with over the years, there've been a couple of us dealing with same sex attraction in the group. Um, I thought I, I would have died before I ever thought at one time I'd ever go into a, a guy's group in a church and talk. Of, I mean, it would have, you know, absolutely killed me to think about doing that. Mm-hmm. But it's it's really where I needed to be to begin growing up and begin understanding. 
I'm a man like any other guy. I'm not some subset of the male population. Sure. I just deal with some of these issues. And, uh, and, and these guys are dealing with their own brokenness, mm -hmm. their own marriages that fell apart years ago because of adultery or because of pornography or because of whatever else. And, and they're sharing their, their pain, their loss, their, their grief, whatever. And, and they're sharing also what God did in their lives. And here's the thing, what I've seen over and over again are guys that'll drag their butts out of bed and get someplace at six o'clock in the morning and have this time together and do it consistently for two or three years um, to come together because it's so much more valuable than what they're experiencing in the book study or the, and, and when I say Bible study, do a Bible study. But most sure. often what I've seen is that most Christians are hiding behind their Bible studies. Oh, sure. They're intellectually engaging. They're not engaging at a heart level. And it, it they're just, again, deflecting everything that's going on with them by their Bible knowledge or the discussion. Mm -hmm. And so with us, what I've seen is guys are ruined in a very good way of ever going back to the tepid, empty, worthless stuff they want they not only want accountability, I hate that all by itself. I want relational accountability. I want men who are in my corner. I want guys who have my back. And when, when guys experience that genuinely, they don't want to go back to what they were doing before. Yeah, I don't, I'm, I'm with you until that last sentence. I've just known, um, you know, in First John, there's this language of antichrist, you know, these peace, people that apostatize and, um, I've seen so many people come into the Holy of Holies in the church and really experience yes. the, the true koinonia, and then Satan gets in them, and they are gone. And it's like it never happened, yeah, and, and they that's, have That's hatred. absolutely true. So, yeah, it's, yeah. but it, it's amazing what people can forget, um, and it's like it never happened. Satan, uh, evil is so powerful, but even so, I know that I've had real experiences with people, even if they have chosen to forgot, forget it, and God knows, and I, I think he's yeah. the preserver of history, even if nobody else remembers. Um, mm -hmm. And that's not meant in an argumentative spirit, but I think the reason, and this is why I, I gently pushed against the bishop when I talked to him a couple months ago, <clears throat> the reason that a lot of people don't do real church is because it hurts. You get really hurt. It, yes. doesn't, it doesn't always go the way that it should. There is Absolutely betrayal, true. there is abandonment, there is, um, th there's a lot of real sadness that comes with being vulnerable to other people because we're around a lot of broken people that will act like they want to be whole and healthy and transformed, but when it when the cards are down, they're gone. You know, and, and I've seen I've seen that, but I've also seen a lot of the other Jeffrey. Yes. I really have. Yeah, I, mean, I, I think there has. I've I don't want to be yeah. one side or the other. I have to say, like. It's just a gamble when you come into the church, and God is going to give you some some brothers that they are going to be solid for you, yep. and there's going to be others that don't turn out, and it, it, I, I, the reason I push is just, if we're honest on the front end, then when that sure. betrayal comes, we can hold on, but if somebody's like, wait, this is the community of God, and this guy... Oh, it's all beautiful and kumbaya, yeah, no, absolutely, so, but the problem I see is that most churches are not even um, conscious of developing the environment mm -hmm. and the, and the real, they, they, they're all about programs and getting a good program <laughs> and that's good. That's admirable, but uh, the environment is broken. The environment yeah. is secretive. Well, and so, I mean, I feel like we're talking about the same thing though, because I think that yep. this program heavy, milk toast, lukewarm, right. uh, this was intentionally crafted over the course of a century and a half, starting with the Sunday school movement and leading to where we are today it was intentionally created uh, for a lot of light, but not much heat, so that people can p play religion, but they're Super not actually sensitive. doing religion. They're not doing what Christ died to make possible in the body, and they can't even imagine that. They they imagine that there's something like, um, do you know the word super arrogation? No. no. <laughs> it's, a, it's a theological Explain concept. It. In the Articles of Religion, one of the things that Methodists uh, rebuke is the notion of super arrogation, where there's like a baseline of salvation, and then there are just some superstars that go way beyond, you know? So baseline is you come to church every Sunday, you give 10% of your income, and you're right. into heaven. But man, some people, they're here every Wednesday, and they volunteer. Those mm. are super arrogators, and that's, yep. that's non-scriptural. There's the standard of Christ, and then there's everything else. 
That's and right. So within the body of Christ, there's a level of intimacy, accountable, relational discipleship that is normative in the body of Christ uh, to, to even resemble Christ and his apostles that churches have chosen to look at as some super arrogation when actually mm-hmm. it's the baseline. And actually the, the baseline that's been set for everybody doesn't save. Um, so you, you, you say some things that, that push people. That's the thing that I would... I think there are a lot of people that are attending church and doing the programs, and they think Absolutely. they're doing... But they're actually not participating in salvation because the temperature is too low. They are still yep. living this double life like you're talking about. They're still letting sin reign in their private life. And the answer to that is not just to go, well, I guess I'm lost. It's to go, well, I guess I'm not doing it right, and I need to do it right. I need a band of brothers. You know, if, if a female's watching yes. this, I need some sisters to walk in faith with me. And yes. I need to actually be vulnerable and honest about this stuff. Right. And if I can't do that at my church, I need to find another church. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. So how much of this that we're talking about overlaps? So do you and your wife, Melissa's her name? Yes. Do y'all, you're about to go on a tour. You're going to be talking at different churches. As mm-hmm. you do so, are you mostly just trying to turn the temperature up in the room? Are you, do you have a curriculum that attaches to, to the fire you hopefully start? Do you have, um, what, 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 what's the infrastructure yep. of what you're doing? So, yeah, um, so I've just, my first book has been uh, written. It's been, it's in the third phase of editing and we'll be going out this week to some beta readers. And so that's going to be coming out. We have some, um, some online uh, curriculum that, that people can, uh, video curriculum that people can use. But again, one of our main um, uh, curricula is not something that we've written. It's something that came out of Desert Stream Ministries, uh, the Living Waters Program. Uh, and that is for us, that's a, a really necessary and helpful program for anybody. It's not just about homosexuality. It's just a, not just about sexual addiction. Uh, so we, so in saying that, uh, if you go to our website, you see a whole bunch of ministries that we are making people aware of because we want to be incredibly collaborative. We don't have any interest in reinventing the wheel or coming up with something similar to what somebody else did. No, if it's going well, it's working well. Um, it's designed well. People are are experiencing life and transformation. Let's get them plugged in, you know, to that. So we do. Um, there's never a desire to simply be provocative for the sake of being provocative. Mm-hmm. It's it's too. Uh, you know, sometimes I'll say something in a in a in kind of a blunt and simple, short kind of way because I want people to be challenged in in the in the subconscious way that we assume and we we. We think that, and we're not even necessarily conscious, sometimes we are, of what we we believe. But when you hear something that's kind of direct, it's like, wait a minute, that doesn't sound, that isn't what I've been doing, or that's not what I'm hearing in church, or that's, and um, and so, yeah, we we don't want to pull punches. I mean, our ministry name is Love and Truth Network. Mm-hmm. One of our, um, our main tagline is leading with love anchored in truth. And so we always want to lead with love, mm-hmm. but we absolutely want truth to do what truth does best which is to expose um, the true nature of, of our hearts and often expose the deception, myself included, that we can so easily live in and, mm-hmm. uh, and live in and be very comfortable in going to church and doing all the, the motions and the structure of it. Mm-hmm. So yeah, we do weekend ministry events, full day events, uh, meeting with leadership teams. I mean, mm-hmm. our main thing is about meeting with leaders, helping them recognize where the environment is really suffering and broken and where everyone is kind of in hiding that's just kind of the way church is mm-hmm. how can how can a leader and leaders elders whatever how can leaders together begin to first recognize it and then begin to shift that begin to change that so churches become more teaching hospitals or frontline mash units than than what they often are these days you know so how much of your energy is directed towards laity and then how much to clergy well so it's it the front line the first would be um typically toward clergy or mm-hmm. often it's through laity that we get connected to clergy but we're trying to work with um with the leaders first mm-hmm. to make sure that people are not leading from the middle you know within an organization but that they have a real blessing but pastors and leaders should not i mean they need to know they need to bless they need to understand what what we're about what we're talking about right but we really want to work with um with lay leaders uh within a church that the pastors would say hey these are like 
for example, when we're doing Living Waters or we're helping the Living Waters program get started in a church or in a community, uh, an association of churches or whatever, we're really looking for um, people who have more of a contemplative um, attitude, more of a contemplative spirit, more mm-hmm. more intercessors. Um, and 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 so we're looking for the leaders to 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 point those people or to kind of handpick those people and you know direct them to us so that we can um, uh, chat with them, kind of evaluate them, do some training with them, encourage them to get to some of the national training so they can bring that kind of thing back uh, to their church. So, so we always want to work through laity, but it's first and foremost making sure that the leadership of the church is fully on board and fully understands, you know, what we're about. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's de- at least a dotted line connection um, that's ongoing to the to the um, uh, the pastors and the, the you know staff uh, or you know professional ministry folks. But lay leaders really need to be empowered and released in these areas. And this is broader than Methodism, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, it certainly is. You know, I mean, Methodism, it seems like I, this isn't exclusive to Methodism, I realize, but mm-hmm. the Walk to Emmaus, you know, has been a, a pretty powerful program for a lot of people. And one of the reasons it's so powerful is because it's so deeply experiential. Mm-hmm. And, and and so people are connecting the, the tactile and the, you know, kind of the whole, the spirit, soul, and body reality of who we are as, as, as um, human beings made in God's image. Uh, it it becomes more so much more than information alone. It, it starts with information. Nothing can happen without that. But in so many churches, we become you know so infotainment addicted. We mm-hmm. take in the information and we largely do nothing with it. Yeah. But it feels good to take it in and give agreement to it. Mm-hmm. Um, but we but yes, we're looking for um, uh, for people to be involved yet in an experiential um, kind of full sounds weird to say full body, but I mean the spirit, soul, and body uh, reality of the uh, of the individuals and done in the context of community. This is, is so the Living important. Waters program. That's, that's yes. So That's really describes Living Waters. So with Walk to Emmaus being a, a, a comparative model, Walk to Emmaus, you have uh, uh, emotionally, subjectively engaging, but also... Spiritually and mentally, yep. uh, you have a, an experience in a group that then on the other side of it, you have fourth day groups that meet regularly so that you're remembering this experience that you had and building upon it. Am mm-hmm. I right to understand um, you and your wife, Melissa, go and speak to a, a church or a group of churches aiming to get them to uh, enroll people in a Living Waters program, which then is followed up by small groups in which they practice building on this foundation that's laid in a similar way to walk to Emmaus. Did I understand this layout correctly? That, that's a, that is, um, yes, I think you understood what I said, okay. what I was saying, but it would be, we highly regard living waters, but so much of, and we always recommend it to a church. Mm-hmm. It doesn't, we're not, we're not out just promoting living waters. We're mm-hmm. really promoting um, it, the church may not go to a living waters model or may not use the program of living waters, but there's other ways, whether it's in small group, men's group, women's group, we, what we really want to do is, is help leaders, um, and lay leaders particularly mm-hmm. become trained and adept at taking the conversation deeper, how, rather than running from people's pain, which is our natural reaction right. or in, in this fear of not having the right answer. And all of a sudden we're exposed and their exposure. And now it's just like, Let's look at the other person and ask them, you know, let's let's shift the conversation to somebody else and get on to the next thing because we feel like a deer in the headlights. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, but ra- but that's actually where the the deep change can happen. If we can abide there, if we can linger there, if we can lean in there. Um, but people have to not just know that information. They have to see it modeled and they have to experience it. And, uh, and to, in order to know how to go, go back and be like, oh, OK, I can actually this I'm fearful. My knees are knocking. That's how I felt in the beginning. Mm -hmm. I don't feel, I mean, listening for God, what do you mean listening for God? Just open up the Bible and read. Well, yes, of course, anything that God says, truly that God says is going to agree with the word. So we need to know the word. So we know the counterfeit Mm -hmm. um, because Satan comes as an angel of light, but the Lord also ministers to us directly. There's a relationship there. And, and so this idea that my sheep hear my voice, I, there is a way that we can really lean into um, walking with people mm-hmm. in um, in really deep and profound ways. I think, for example, of one of our um, uh, high capacity volunteers with our ministry and a dear friend of ours, whose um, 
her testimony is on our website as well, but whose mother sold her as a little tiny girl um, to support her drug habit, her mom's drug habit, or to pay for rent or whatever. So she's being raped and, and molested as a little tiny girl mm -hmm. all the way, you know, until um, I, I don't know what age, but just countless numbers of times brutalized by uh, by men. And um, and the Lord is is has been healing that over the course of many years, mm. but she's still in this healing process. Sure. And she's but she needs a place to be able to talk this stuff out. And and yes, counseling office for sure. But beyond that, where 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 they're equipped to handle trauma, we need to make sure that that well equipped people are involved in this process. But mm. she also needs community. Yeah. She also needs places where she's known and loved right in the middle of that pain. And that doesn't happen in your typical church setting and dynamic. And so we want to help churches be able to get to that place. And man, when it happens, my former pastor used to say, when the when the tide comes in, all the boats rise. Everybody in that church benefits from that deeper walk and that deeper living. So if I were your salesman, your your agent responsible for, for selling what you're and you're not at all conducting yourself as a salesman so i'm the salesman here but I, I hope not but i would yeah. i would i would say that what what the love and truth network is a part of is not just selling a book that you've written although you're happy to sell your book it's not just getting people to do the living waters program although that's a fa fantastic program and you're happy mm -hmm. to facilitate that the primary objective is to facilitate a culture shift in local churches that actually gets down to root issues of sin and uh, roots Satan out of people's lives, simultaneously uh, increasing the quality of the koinonia fellowship in the body and resulting in, in individual and communal transformation. So th have uh, I heard where you nailed passion? it? Okay. okay. Yeah, you nailed it. And actually, I hope I can get this video recording so I can write down what you just said, because it was so good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad yeah. I understood it because, yeah, I've, I've, uh, when you're doing something like this, you know, you got to pay the bills and there has to be something that makes money. But also when you have a heart for ministry, what's the, mm -hmm. what's the nugget that really motivates you and, and uh, keeps you going? So I'm, I'm very happy in the context of the local church. But also, I, I mean, I've loved doing this YouTube channel where my reach is a lot further, and there are people who have really responded very personally, going, man, I really, I'm really, i glad for you helping me think through this stuff, and I think this is yeah. really engaging and, and helpful. And that's not to toot my own horn, but I do think it's just we're all concerned with this fabric that we're all yes. attached to, and it's just not going well right now. And so I can either just isolate myself like so many pastors do and just I'm going to have my own little island here and do the best that I can right. or I can try and and be responsible in in affecting other contexts and be be affected by other contexts. Now I'm not going on the road. You and Melissa and I assume your boys go on the road with you, right? For the summer uh we do a family ministry trip and uh so we have family back in upstate New York and in New Jersey. Uh, but the main, the majority of the time we're actually doing ministry, but we actually get to see family and, and all that too. So we're together for that, but we also um, uh, homeschool our boys. And my wife is also a licensed uh, Christian counselor. So, uh, so she has her own practice here. So she, with the majority of the time I'm traveling on my own throughout the year. Mm -hmm. And then um, on occasion at different points, we'll travel together, but mostly our big tra travel together is um, uh, for, you know, five, six, seven weeks in the summer. Wow. Wow. Yeah, we, we have four kids, seven, five, two, and one. And Wow. Uh, yeah. Bless you. Man, uh, traveling is just the worst. It's just the worst, as, as I'm thinking about your schedule. But then also being away is the worst, so I'm just like, okay, it's I'm true. living at home for yeah. years. But, um, right. you know, uh, God bless you for that. I mean, that's that's really an apostolic calling in, in some sense. You, you, you can't... Uh, you have to keep moving. So, I mean, I, I know how to pray for you now, <laughs> now that yeah, I Yeah, and our boys like. are yeah. amazing. I mean, yeah. they, they love meeting new people. Mm -hmm. They, you know, they're, I mean, God just, and I, if we had three or four or five, I mean, that could be you know, a whole other thing, but um, having the two, I mean, they're super, they're now 14 and, and almost 12, uh, but we've been doing this for a long time and they're really excited about getting on the road and, driving and stopping at four different places. The reason we're stopping at four places is we have four four friends we want to yeah. see and hang out with. And actually one family we don't even know yet. Uh, they just said, hey, we, you know, we're elders at this church and the pastor reached out to us. We'd love to host you. We have lots of room. 
And so that's how we make, you know, new friends and new connections. And that, that just builds kind of this, this train across the U S. Um, so they're, they're on board and they, they love it. You know, that's fine. So, Tell me, uh, say again, how old they are. Uh, 14 just turned 14 and, uh, my youngest is going to be 12, uh, later this month. I was awful at that stage of life. I'm so glad you, you enjoyed it. I was and too. Oh my you. gosh. Yeah. I was horrible. Yeah. Yes. Well, I, I, I'll know, uh, I'll know the excitement <laughs> of that here in a few years. Check back in with me, but, um, all right. So, uh, I, I want to try and sum up how it is. If people have enjoyed hearing you talk and they have a shared passion about what you're passionate about, they think that they would like to, to be a part of what you're doing. Um, I'm inclined. Do you have, is there a website? Do you have a website for transform or, uh, Love yeah. Truth yeah. So it's just, so within the UMC or the GMC, uh, you can go to either our websites, but the the Transforming Congregations is the ministry uh, that most um, connects with um, Methodism okay. and and the UMC GMC, and that's simply transformingcongregations.org, O-R-G. Okay. Okay. Uh, the confusing thing is with Love and Truth Network, it's com. So uh, okay. that uh, website is simply the ministry name, love, and then the ampersand is spelled out in the URL loveandtruthnetwork.com. I'll make sure to get it right in the show notes. For anybody who listens to this on podcast, you should be able to go to your show notes, but also YouTube, Facebook. Uh, I should have it there for you. Um, there's a Facebook page, isn't there? For yeah, you? yeah, we have a Facebook page. Um, again, YouTube channel, at least yeah. for now. Yeah. Uh, but we're out in a number of uh, a number of places just trying to um, yeah, get the message out there and, and increase uh, the footprint of influence that God's put before us. If somebody wants to seek you out for a personal conference, I, I would imagine there are a number of people who hear your story and then they yeah. just have to tell you theirs. Is that something you welcome? Is there a way you want them to go about that? Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm happy for that. Or if somebody's struggling and looking for some help or support, that they, they can go to our website and um, literally uh, they can go to my calendar. Now, my calendar is not going to be available during the travel that I'll be doing in New York, but or they can go to my calendar and, and pick a time. Um, I think it's usually on Tuesdays when um, I'll do a Zoom with them for you know up to an hour or a uh, phone call or whatever. And so they can feel free to, to do that. Um, cool. They could also just call the ministry uh, at the phone number that's on the website as well and talk to my assistant, Jeremiah. Um, and if, if they have questions, he can also be incredibly helpful, too, uh, with helping them navigate questions or issues. Well, I think this is a good, you know, I, I don't know how often I want to have explicitly sexual conversations, but you know what? This was pretty good. And if it gets a good response, then I'd be an idiot not to, to do it. But um I, I hope that people who watch this, I, I hope they're at least aware of your ministry so that as things come along, they can go, I know a guy who was really passionate yep. about this and articulate. Um, and I, I hope you continue to see, you know, I whether or not, you know, it's a hard, it's a hard, I'm, I'm real passionate about transformative, accountable, mutually vulnerable discipleship, you know, whatever mm. tagline you want to put on there. So yep. I hope you see massive success here. I, I hope you are successful in... Um, uh, transforming congregations, the culture of congregations, uh, a lot of individuals' lives. I hope they feel convicted by you and, and what you and your wife have to offer, and uh, may there be much success uh, for your, your organization. Thank you for spending time with me today. Is there anything else you'd like to say before we conclude? No, I think that's great. I just appreciate the opportunity, Jeffrey, and have loved uh, chatting with you and, and hearing your points of view as well. So thank you so much. Right on. All right. Well, I'm, I'm going to cut things off now. If you've enjoyed the conversation, um, let us know in the comments. Feel free to share this. If there's anybody you know who you think would really benefit from hearing Gary talk for a bit, or um, is, feel free to send them this or just send them directly to the website. This is obviously something that's very sensitive, but also just super important. It's probably at the heart of faith and uh, life in, in the community of faith, so um Pray about ways, you know, pray for Gary and then pray about ways that you can support his project, whether or not it's tied to him directly. I, I just think it's a really worthy thing to be thinking and praying about. So thanks for, for watching, and I'll, uh, I'll see you next time.